Okay, I'm going to start timer because this is the first time I've given this talk, and this is the first time I'm showing this demo, so I have no clue how long it should take. Hopefully, we're going to keep it under around like uh, 30 minutes because there's quite a lot of stuff to set up and set down. Um, hello, everyone. Uh, my name is, is Zach Akil. I am here, and this is the first time me doing this, and it's not rehearsed. Uh, how is everyone doing? <laughs> everyone good? Okay, cool. So we just had lunch, so you probably, all that, all the blood flows go into digestion, your food, not so much to the brain. I hear that science. Um, so this is going to be a nice, chilled out, hence the clothing, uh, talk. Uh, I'm not going to go into like crazy depth, hopefully. I think, well, I, I, I can't judge myself. Um, but I've seen, I've seen a few of the other talks uh, today, or a few snippets of them, and they all, they all were like really, really useful. Uh, this is more in contrast to those. <laughs> uh, we're gonna, uh, I want to first sort of set the, set the stage of w what this is kind of going to be like. So first of all, I will wait for this to turn on, and then, and then we'll work. Perfect. Great start. Let's click. Exit, restart. There we go. What's my jam? Uh, so I like building stuff that's sort of more physical. And I sort of I got my start in programming with Arduinos and Raspberry Pis. How many people have used Arduinos or Raspberry Pis? Quite a few people. Yeah. So it's like really fun physical stuff. So this is an example of the kind of stuff I build where I took like a scikit-learn model and I would export out all the weights whilst it's training, and I visualize them on like a um, 3D printed uh, RGB LED strip so that you could physically see the training happening. Uh, so this is an indication of something that's really cool and isn't actually that useful. So like, <laughs> I can't, uh, like it, it was I literally, so it's, you, you can probably sort of see, oh, you can see here that it's like actually on my apartment wall. Uh, that's, it's a piece of art, it's not a useful thing. Well, that's, that's, that's controversial to say, but okay. That's an example. Uh, other stuff I like to do is like, um, things with the real world, so vision applications, so machine vision. Has anyone here done any ma machine vision? Any machine vision engineering? Machine, okay, so this is an example of one where I've uh, done analysis on a basketball shot by building like custom TensorFlow models. Um, one of my more recent ones, and this is, this is a really good example. Uh, this is, some of you might have seen it. Uh, this is an example of a robot that would give you feedback about the food that you ate, and the way that it gave you feedback was more physical. <laughs> so the idea is that I built this just before uh, New Year's. So it's like a New Year's resolution robot. And so, yeah, it's using Raspberry Pi. It's using cloud-hosted machine learning. And then, yeah, you don't need to think about the food. You just come back, set it on your desk. And if it's still there, you can eat it. <laughs> so, that, so, that's the, so hopefully everyone's kind of lowered their expectations for how useful this talk might be, um, which is a great way to start. OK, enough about Enough about me. What about you? Uh, OK, so who's in the room? Who here has actually built a machine learning model before? Hopefully, most of the people. OK, awesome, cool. I've got a list here. Who here uh, has used a Raspberry Pi? OK, noted. Uh, who here has used GPU acceleration for faster training? Quite a few people. Who, who here has used TPU acceleration for faster training? Ooh, ooh, OK. Uh, and who here has heard or used TF light models? Oh, damn. Okay. That's good things to focus on. All right. Awesome. So, who here cycles? Cool. So, who here cycles in London? <laughs> awesome. it's, a diff it's a different crowd. Uh, and who here would recommend cycling in London to a loved one? <laughs> oh, damn. Oh, that's, that's heartless. OK, so yeah, if you've ever cycled in London, uh, it's, it's known to be quite perilous. Uh, you've got to watch out for a lot of things. You've got to watch out for buses, trucks, motorcycles, and other cyclists. Uh, this is, anyone recognize where this is? A couple of people. So yeah, this is a, this is a place uh, in, near Farringdon. So on my commute, I used to cycle up through here. And there's an interesting uh, cycle path that comes through here. And what would happen is there would be two sort of uh, channels of cyclists fit on this path, and there's this like turn off. So you'd get the inside channel of cyclists will come up and then go to turn left, 
and then the outside will continue on straight. Now, there are no markings to indicate this, so if you haven't cycled this route before, you're not going to know that if you are on this side of the cycle path, that, that's the side that's turning out, um, that line is going to stop quite abruptly because there's traffic lights there. But the line next to you is going to keep going. And this happened to me, and I was, I was in the lane that was going to be turning off, but I wanted to keep going straight. And so naturally, okay, this, this line was slowing down, but the line next to me, there was no one there. So I just turned out into it. Um, I quickly realized, based off of some aggressive yelling from a, a cyclist behind me, that I didn't look behind me, and he was actually right, right, right there. However, I couldn't have looked because I was looking forward. So there was this thing where if I just knew what was behind me, it would be useful. And there's many other instances where this sort of thing would help, like one time I tried to pull out and a motorcyclist was overtaking me at the same time, which, is, which is, happens a lot. Uh, and then also cycling home on like a more quiet road, not realizing that a car is coming up behind you quite quickly, maybe because you're listening to like the sound of birds, definitely not your headphones. Um, so this is a problem. I want to try to solve it. Uh, and I want to first, yeah, by the way, if you're cycling in London, you might need superhuman abilities. Uh, looking backwards and looking forwards is equally as important. Uh, how do other people solve it? Or how has it already been solved by bikes? Well, there's this technology that's quite useful known as mirrors. So <laughs> some people use these mirrors. Uh, I don't like them because they look a bit ugly. But also, I th I've come up with a reason why they're not good. And that's because you actually have to look at the mirror to use it. So you have to look down, which is quite a big way to look. So from there to there. And then you have to like run your own classification model as to what's behind you. So yeah, so I don't like that. And also, like, it doesn't run machine learning. So <laughs> that's, I don't like that. But these also exist. Who, who's ever seen these? So you can actually get rear view cameras for bikes. I know, yeah. I didn't know they existed. But it's the same as a mirror, so I don't like it. <laughs> OK, so what do other uh, modes of transport use? Well, uh, the handy people at Tesla, they've got their self-driving car that does, isn't actually self-driving, but we won't talk about that. Uh, it can use a mirror of sensors to detect all the cars that's around it. And if you've ever been in one of these things, you get this cool little UI readout of like what's next to you, what's to your left, what's to your right. And this image doesn't show it, but what it also does is, I put an arrow to remind me to say this, uh, it will actually do kind of classification as to what's around you. So if you've got a truck, it will display a truck, I think. I may be remembering it through rose tinted glasses, but I think it does actually do that. It displays different sizes of vehicles. Can anyone confirm this? No? OK, we'll assume it's true. Yeah, yeah? OK, cool. All right. So yeah, that's, that's a cool idea of classifying what's behind you. Because if you're cycling in London, uh, different vehicles, you probably should re react to them in different ways. So for example, the bus, although it looks quite uh, intimidating, it's actually, I find it personally, not that bad to cycle around. And I think that's due to all the visibility that the bus driver has. Uh, of around the vehicle, like all the windows. They've even got cameras mounted everywhere. So I think they're actually relatively safe to cycle around. Um, on the other hand, you've got these sort of vehicles, which are the same size as buses, but with next to no visibility. And being able to classify what the different types of vehicles are behind you would be useful. So we could say, like, this is a nice gentle giant, and you've got apocalypse machines <laughs> just coming up behind you. So I want to build a system that kind of does this. Uh, so the idea, the plan, is imagine I've got an image that's been taken from behind uh, my bike, and I run a classification model on it, so specifically an object detection model. Who here is familiar with object detection models? Hopefully most people, yeah. So object detection model is a model that can take an image, tell you what's inside the image, and also where specifically inside the image it is. So if I could do this, this would be cool. But then I need to relay that information to me. Uh, I was thinking of uh, audio, like through headphones, but I don't want to do that. I want to do vision. Uh, so the idea is putting lights on the handlebars, like an LED bar. And so if there's something dangerous on your right-hand side, light up red. If there's something not so dangerous, light up green. Uh, yeah, so that's the plan. So how am I going to build it? So I previously built some stuff, and I want to I use a Raspberry Pi because it runs Python. Uh, that's it. And the, Python, uh, the Raspberry Pi comes with a camera module that works really well with it, so I'll use that as well. For the output, I'm going to use one of these. So who's heard of an LED strip? Like most of you guys. So you see them in like sort of these sort of cheap shops as lighting up stuff. But those, you power them, and they just run a single color. This is a special type of LED strip called an addressable LED strip. And that means with code, we can actually send individual uh, commands to individual LEDs to tell them to turn on and off. 
Uh, so that's going to be perfect for the project. Specifically, it's a NeoPixel LED strip. Now, this isn't important now, but it is important later, but we'll get on to that. All right, for the model, uh, there's loads of object detection models out there, so I'm thinking, why bother build my own? So I'm going to use this one, uh, MobileNet Single Shot Detector version 1, because it was the first one I found online. Uh, <laughs> the data set used to train it is going to be the COCO data set. Who's heard of the COCO data set? So I just recently heard of it. Uh, I didn't actually check what data set was used to train the model, but this is the one that was used to train the model. Uh, it's a big open vision data set that has vision labels for segmentation, object detection, and classification, and probably more. What's really cool about it is that built into it, you, you want to find out more, you can go to the, this, uh, this URL about that data set, but built into it, it already has labels for cars, buses, trucks, bicycles, and motorbikes. Like, perfect, I don't have to label my own data set, I can just use this. And what's even better is I can find a pre-trained model online. So I'm just going to use that. Now, time for the demo. Hopefully I'm good for time. Yep, 10 minutes in. All right. So I like, I like doing demos for talks. Usually they're not as stressful as the demo I'm about to do because usually they're software demos. Hardware demos are a different story. So what I've got here is some special hardware that is going to uh, run on a bicycle. And if you look towards the back of the room, you will witness a diversion because it's actually down here. <laughs> and <laughs> if <laughs> all right. So what I've done, I've built a bike. Because uh, it was easier to build one than just you know find one on the street. Uh, I've got a bike, right? Ooh. All right. But it doesn't stand by itself. Aha. Built a stand. All right. So just like that. So yes, I'm having to actually build the demo. But look, no handlebars. Boom. <laughs> so handlebars slide on. Look at this. It's like an IKEA demonstration. <laughs> All right. So the handlebars are on. Uh, I think that's it. Oh, power. No, it's powered. OK. Whew. I switch to the Raspberry Pi. I've lost the keyboard. Here it is. I wake up the route. Oh, there it is. Oh, yes. And you can see the really good resolution. Um, I have to guess the last command I ran. OK. So we've got here, we've got the Raspberry Pi magic on this side. Uh, it's not an invisible Raspberry Pi. It's, on, it's just on the other side. We have the LED strip. Uh, I need to connect the LED strip. So let's remember the colors. This one, yes. And power the LED strip. Whew. Are you ready? Because I'm not. OK, there's light. Now what I'm going to do, I've built my model. I've, it's a model that's compiled to TF Lite. Uh, it's designed to run fast on mobile. Uh, I have here the latest Raspberry Pi. Does anyone know what the latest Raspberry Pi is? Four. Oh, everyone. Cool. Uh, so yeah, this is the Raspberry Pi 4. Uh, and I'm going to run the model. Let's see. Yes. That's what it, that's what it sees, maybe. Oh, yeah, you can't see the light. OK, this is going to be interesting. So everyone can see everyone. Nice, because everyone needs to see the handlebars. OK, we'll, we'll approach that later. So uh, there's no cars in this room yet. <laughs> All right. So this, is a, this was a very strange expense report to fill out. Uh, so we've got buses. <laughs> we've got some, oh, there's a nice gray car there. All right, but there's no road. Got a road, look at this. <laughs> All right, got a road. But it's a bit too low down. And I, there we go. I built something really cool, a piece of cardboard, to get it a bit closer. All right. So what we can see here is the model and the model speed at the top. This is how long the model takes to actually make the prediction. Uh, it's taken about 300, 400 milliseconds. <coughs> Let's see if it's actually going to work, because it wasn't trained on toy cars. Um, all right. It's naturally, it's going to be not good, because why would it be? It's a live demo. OK. 
it's kind of getting, it's lighting up the handlebars of anyone in this room. Okay, you, you can relate to that side, that the handlebars are lighting up red on this, maybe you can see off my hand, yeah. Okay, so it's working there. But look, a friendly bus. <laughs> and the handlebar lights up green on this side, kind of. Okay, so the mo uh, we're all machine learning engineers. The model wasn't trained on toys, uh, and neither was with outputs from this camera. So that works all right for my first attempt. Cool, cool, cool. Thank you. All right. Okay. So key points to make is the speed at the top. Three, around 400 uh, milliseconds. So this is the first model. All right. Uh, so I built it. It's already built. That's great. What more is there to, to know? Um, well, a lot because I forget. There's my timer. Halfway through. Perfect. Because um, I have a need, a need for low latency. Uh, so I want to run this model quite a bit faster because it's a bit too slow. Uh, if, if the model is only updating my handlebars, maybe once or twice a second. On London roads, that's, I'm practically dead already. <laughs> uh, so what I want to do is get the model to run faster, and I put in a link to the, this talk description about a talk I actually gave at Pi Data a couple of years ago, where I was building a same sort of vision-based uh, Raspberry Pi robot for rugby. And the way I made it run faster is I did this sort of standard approach. I need to make the model uh, less complex, but if I want to reduce the complexity of my model, like make it a smaller model, use fewer layers, uh, I probably need to do more manual feature engineering to compensate for that. Uh, so that's what I did. So this is actually uh, a GIF that I used in that talk. So this is the original input image. It's already trimmed. Uh, I calculated, I call it a delta image, so subtracting one frame from the next to just get the change in pixels. And then because I was only interested in panning the camera side to side, I just uh, summed all the pixels along the vertical axis. So it reduced the, the input feature space massively, and it made the model run uh, quite a bit quicker. So it went down from like uh, a second or two, down to still only about like 300, 400 milliseconds. It was a scikit-learn model. Uh, and so that was, that, was a good, that was a cool approach, uh, but I still had to do the feature engineering. And I, for this application, I kind of have no clue what kind of feature engineering to do that would help reduce the complexity of the model. So another op option is to increase the hardware speed, so to use GPUs. So GPUs, uh, they're graphical processing units. They're designed initially for graphics. Most of graphics is just matrix multiplication, and handily enough, so is most of deep learning. So there is that shift where we started using graphics cards to do faster deep learning. Uh, as a demo, has anyone ever seen GPU acceleration before? Who here has actually seen GPU acceleration before? I hope we, okay, a small chunk. So let me actually show people uh, what it is. Well, first of all, this is going to disconnect, which is great. Uh, so I've got here uh, a deep learning model for the eminence data set, so the handwritten digits data set, and this is training on a CPU. So it's a bit small, but I'll zoom in. Okay. So we got it training here. It's training the first epoch, and the first epoch is going to take roughly two, uh, two minutes and 30 seconds. Okay, so that's on a CPU. Uh, now, the exact same code after I reconnect, uh, but this is time it's going to be running with a GPU. And we will see it goes down from 2 minutes and 30 seconds. Once it starts, oh, there it is. Oh, it's already almost finished. So <laughs> one, one epoch it lasts about 9 seconds. So GPU acceleration just has incredible effects because it's most of deep, deep, uh, deep neural networks benefit hugely from parallelized execution. And is it parallel? That's, what, that's not the word. Parallel. Uh, parallel execution. And that's what GPUs are really, really good at. So naturally, if you want to try this out yourself uh, and you're using, if you're familiar with Colab, you can set the runtime environment somewhere. Somewhere. Doesn't matter. Uh, so yeah, that's the that's power of GPU acceleration. It's very cool. Uh, so let's, let's take a step back and look at Neural Networks 101.0000. So this is, we can agree, what a neural network kind of looks like. Still good for time. Uh, and we train, when we train a neural network, we get our feature weights or our weights uh, within inside the neural network. So this is an example of each connection between a node has, has a weight assigned to it and it's learnt. Um, this isn't perfect because I'm missing the, the bias node if people are being specific. And at each node, we're doing some kind of summation of the previous node's connections and blah, blah, blah. We can all agree that's what a neural network does. Yeah, cool. Except it doesn't because the numbers tend to look like this. Aha. Uh -huh. So with 
standard uh, like Keras, Keras's default way of storing values is in float 32 bit. Uh, so this is this kind of roughly translates to about seven or eight uh, digits of precision. Uh, so this is what a neural network tends to look like, which is fine. So let's assume this is a neural network for predicting car or boat. Uh, the predictions will go through, but the outputs we tend to, especially for classification, we're not really doing any precise uh, calculations. We tend to just be doing something like this. So for for just like single single label classification, we're just saying what's the maximum of this output. Actually, let me zoom in. So these outputs: the boat is 0 0.98 something something something, and then the car is 0 0.59 something something something. When we're getting a prediction, we're just like, okay, just give give me the max, uh, and that's that's cool. Uh, we didn't we didn't need any of the precision beforehand, but that's fine. Uh, for things like multi classification, we tend to just be using some quite round threshold cutoff of like what is it 0 0.5. So any, any of these that are greater than 0 0.5, just give me those back. And even in the case of regression, uh, I, I know personally a lot of the time I'm not really using any, any more precision than maybe two or three decimal places. So for prediction, I'm not really, don't really need the precision. But the precision is incredibly useful because only with that precision can you do things like gradient calculations accurately, which is incredibly important for backpropagation to actually work. So these are incredibly important for training, but not incredibly important for prediction. Uh, and in case you're wondering what a boat car looks like, that's a boat car. <laughs> uh, so what can we do to make our model run faster is we can actually just get these numbers and reduce them. So we can do a thing called quantization, which is basically like just rounding the numbers down to a smaller, uh, a smaller uh, uh, data type. So our numbers actually start being represented like this. And our outputs don't actually change that much. Uh, you, you can see uh, slight, slight changes, but in terms of because we're doing our, our still like big round output calculations, uh, we're, we're almost definitely going to get the same outputs when we, when we do this. And we end up reducing the size of the, the, the model massively. So yeah, that's quantization. That's one thing we can do to improve the neural networks. And this is uh, a change we do in software. So this is like a software optimization. And this is great. This works great. So even on, even on GPUs, GPUs will run uh, a lot faster with quantized models. And in fact, that's what TF light models are a lot of time. They, they do quantization for you built in, so they'll run a bit faster because of that, and they'll take up less space in memory. Uh, but, OK, is there any, any like computer architect engineers in the room? OK, good, because what I'm about to say is probably wrong. Uh, so on a GPU, uh, when you store a quantized bit, I, it's probably wasting some part of the actual chip, because the GPU itself uh, is designed for 32-bit floating point, at least that's what uh, I find on the internet. So the GPU is actually designed on the hardware level to do 32-bit float operations. So when we quantize our, our, our data to be like a smaller bit, like maybe 8-bit or 16-bit, it is still taking up less space. It will still have to do less calculations. But as we go through and do the calculation, uh, this is all unused. It probably isn't key checking everything else, uh, but there's, there's still that physical space on the board that isn't utilized. So let's imagine a hypothetical hardware that is specifically designed for these quantized numbers. So on the physical space, we might be representing numbers like this. So there's no wasted space. All the numbers and all the operations can be super close together on the board. And we don't need to imagine anymore. We can have an edge TPU, because that is exactly what an edge TPU is. So here's an example of one we have called the dev board. I actually have it here. So this is the dev board. So it's about the size of a Raspberry Pi. It is not a Raspberry Pi. I'm going to point that out later. So it's not a Raspberry Pi. Uh, but it has this TPU hardware on it. So it's a hardware specifically designed to run these quantized machine learning models. And we also have a USB version, which is the potentially the one I'm going to use. Uh, yeah, so again, this is the, the hardware that is optimized for the quantized models. I don't think I was going to make another point. Yeah, they're designed to run fast. Uh, because there's taking up less room on the board, they, they run the same models a lot more efficiently. And yeah, they're, they're designed to run all the models uh, independent of like uh, cloud connections. So the models on the actual edge GPU. So the, the, the diagram I showed earlier about how much space they're taking up on the board, that was kind of uh, an educated guess based off of this requirement that is on the website. So it says the TPU only supports TensorFlow Lite models that are fully 8-bit quantized and then compiled specifically for the edge GPU. So this, uh, this is a limitation of the board. It can only run these TensorFlow Lite models that are compiled specifically for it. Uh, I, because the model I used was already a pre-trained model, uh, I didn't have to train my own model. So there's more 
there's a specific set list of operations that are supported. Uh, the TPU seems to be using a lot of use cases to do with vision, so all the sort of convolutional layer uh, operators are all supported, and I've got a link that actually lists all the supported operators. Uh, if you want to do learning, as I stated before, learning requires this uh, precision to run backpropagation, so you cannot do backpropagation on the edge TPU uh, itself. However, there is support for some forms of transfer learning, using things like nearest neighbors and using the actual neural network to do stuff. I didn't do it, so I don't know a lot about it. But here's a, a link that tells you a bit more about it. And if you want to build your model from scratch, this person made an incredible notebook, uh, which takes a Keras model, uh, you build it from scratch in a, in a collab, and it runs through all the steps to compile it for the Edge TPU. So that's an incredible resource. So mad props to Otaman. Uh, yeah, that's the Edge TPU models. Potholes in my journey, before, as I'm stalling before doing this. Um, so yeah, as I pointed out before, this is not a Raspberry Pi, which I did not know when I first bought it. Uh, I assumed that the GPIO pins, if you've ever used Raspberry Pi, you've got these line of pins that you can connect anything to, so. It's roughly on this side of the board. These like line of pins, you can connect LEDs to them, you can connect uh, uh, LED strips. Uh, other LED related things. Uh, and it looks like it's a Raspberry Pi. See, it I thought uh, surely it's the same. Uh, and it does run Linux, but it isn't because it turns out this specific LED strip is a NeoPixel LED strip and the library that, that the manufacturers wrote for it was written specifically for the Raspberry Pi and specifically the hardware architecture on the Raspberry Pi. So for this specific component, this NeoPixel LED strip, I could not get this to work with the uh, dev board because it is a slightly different uh, hardware architecture to the Raspberry Pi. Uh, that was the first roadblock, and how I fixed that was I stopped using it. Uh, <laughs> the other roadblock is the Raspberry Pi 4 is a very new piece of technology, and so is the accelerator. Uh, all the, all the edge, edge CPUs are still quite new. And I would not wish on my worst enemy the feeling of searching on Stack Overflow for questions that don't exist. <laughs> like, that feeling, you could not feel more alone in the world when you search and there's just nothing on Stack Overflow, no one's encountered this. And I was always thinking, it's like, who are the people that are tackling these problems really early? And then I was, oh, God damn it, now it's me. <laughs> but, so that was the problem. So the default version of Python on the Raspberry Pi 4 is, ras is Python 3.7, which is nice, go them. But the Raspberry Pi 3's default was 3.5, and that three, Python 3.5 is what a lot of the instructions for the Edge TPU are built around. So that's a thing to, to watch out for. Also, the Pi camera doesn't like to be resized. Um, I'll just skip that bit. <laughs> Final demo. So where is this Edge GPU? Oh wait, it's in my pocket. So here it is. All right, uh, I'll switch back. So I've got the Edge GPU. I've got USB cable. And you might notice I've got a little bottle cage. Look at that. <laughs> right? And I'm gonna plug this in. Uh, let's make sure this is still on. It's still there, cool, cool, cool. I'll plug this in here. And I'm gonna run. Now who, who, who remembers the speed of the previous model? Yeah. Probably 300, 400, it's gonna run this model. It's gonna be the same exact model, doing the same exact predictions, which are probably gonna be bad, but it's the same model. And it's gone from three, 400, down to 40 or less. Okay, let's, let's see if we can get some nice friendly bus. Oh wait, gotta put the road on. <laughs> we got friendly bus, a bit quicker, you can see it moving across the handlebars, a bit nicer. I oh, know, look, dangerous car. And this car's red, <laughs> but let's see. Let's, it's a much, much, much nicer experience. Let's get, ooh, let's get a red car, and another red car. So it's much quicker response, and then, oh look, bus comes in between. And we got green, red, green, red. Maybe you can't see it on that side, but it's, it works. It's a lot, lot quicker. Um, yeah, thank you. <laughs> All right. But wait, there's more. Because, because it's, it's very quick, but I think we can be quicker. And the specific reason why I made my life a lot harder by using the Raspberry Pi 4 as it was released is because the Raspberry Pi 4 has something special on it. Does anyone know what has a, a special? What was that? No. <laughs> but, just kidding. It has, 
USB 3. This is currently plugged into USB 2. USB 2 bottlenecks the, acceler the accelerator because getting, getting the data on and uh, getting the data on is the main, is the main issue with it. So I'm, I've just plugged it out of USB 2 and plugged it into USB 3. The speed, does anyone remember what the speed was? It was 50, 40? All right, let's just by changing, is that the right script? Oh, can't read, I'm just guessing. All right, just by changing the port from the USB 2 to USB 3 on the Raspberry Pi 4, I should say more numbers. Uh, it's gone from 40 to 50 down to that number. <laughs> All right, and we can see, oh, you got the car, it's pretty on a friendly bus. And the cool thing, yeah, don't, don't worry about the model being terrible. Worry about the, the speed, because I, I could put in any model I wanted. And the future, the future is, of course, I'm going to train an actual model on toys. I'm going to overfit the hell out of it so that it works. <laughs> All right. So that is, that is the future plan for, for the project. But yeah, 14, 50 milliseconds on a device the size of a Raspberry Pi running a full convolutional model magic. But yeah, that's that. That's that demo. Uh, I'll take away. All right. So the final sort of thought is if you want to go out and do sort of play around with this stuff yourself, uh, I recommend the Raspberry Pi 4, even though it gave me a lot of help, but specifically the USB 3 gives you such a huge increase. And uh, there's probably going to be, uh, maybe I shouldn't pre-answer the question, but in terms of the speed difference between the dev board and the Raspberry Pi or the accelerator, there is none. It's the exact same chip. Uh, the only time you get a speed difference is when the accelerator is bottlenecked by USB 2. So yeah, that's one question wasted. Um, the Pi camera module, there's loads of so uh, example code that works with the camera module and the Raspberry Pi, so that's why I think that's the, the most streamlined uh, way of building stuff for it. And I would recommend the USB accelerator over the dev board, uh, just because it means I get to stay in the Raspberry Pi ecosystem where there's loads of help online. And yeah, provided you're using it with the Raspberry Pi 4, you get no reduce, reduction in speed. Uh, with that, thank you so much to you all for being here. Thank you so much for this to work. And yeah, here's all the code, and I'm happy to answer any questions you have. Hey, great talk, by the way. Thank you. Oh, thank thanks. you for that. Um, I just wanted to ask, uh, for the accelerator, do you have to like install anything, uh, or does it just, is it just pu plug and play? Oh yeah, okay, that's a great question. Uh, yeah, there is, there is an installation for it, and in fact, that's another good reason to use the accelerator USB stick over this. The installation to get this thing sort of set up is, I thought, I find a bit long. Uh, for the accelerator, it's a pip install. It's like two, two lines of installation, and you get the, the code and loads of example code and stuff, yeah. Um. Is it the case that whatever uh, like version of TensorFlow Lite you've got there, is it just automatically detecting the um, accelerator, or were you running a different script? Uh, yeah, so the, the actual TF Lite models, uh, they have to be specially compiled for the edge TPU. Uh, it takes, there's a, that, that notebook that I showed is incredible because it shows you the process of uh, compiling it for it, but yeah, it, it goes from a standard TF Lite model and turns it into this edge TPU TF Lite model, which are uh, identical in what predictions they make, but they're just, I guess the code is specific to how the hardware works, but yeah, it's a specific model type. How, how about the battery? How long can you cycle with Raspberry Pi, TPU, and the camera? The battery, like, okay, that's, that's a good question. I haven't cycled this bike. Okay. okay. <laughs> um, it's, so that's a feature bit is, I haven't actually mounted this on a real bike. Uh, however, the TPU is supposed to be quite efficient. However, I think it gets quite, Gets a bit toasty, so I don't know how efficient it really is. Uh, but it is being powered solely by the USB port on a Raspberry Pi, so that gives you some indication of how efficient it actually is, especially when you do, like, there's people have done loads of benchmarks online comparing this against desktop GPUs, and this, the fact that this single USB stick outperforms them is sort of a testament to how efficient it is actually running the models. Um, thanks for the demo. <laughs> especially, I like your demo kit. Uh, first question, where do you get this demo things. Where do I get? Where do I yeah, get it? Where, where do you get it? Or you make it yourself? Or? Oh yeah, I made this myself. Oh, that's yeah, cool. So this is, uh, yeah, oh, yeah, oh, yeah. Cool. Uh, <laughs> that's like the most <laughs> impressive bit. Yeah. So this is all like uh, laser cut. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I was going to initially hand cut it all, uh, but then someone said you can use a laser cutter. Yeah. <laughs> and, then 
And I noticed when you put the, your road on, you, the, the accuracy of the recognize the cars and the bus has been increased. And do you, without that, you know, your road seems they can't recognize anything. Can you explain that? So that is a good question. So I, would, I think that it gives the impression that the accuracy has increased. But what it's actually doing is, because I'm able to sort of move it around a bit more with a bit more fidelity when it's making the fi predictions faster. So I was able to position the car a bit quicker because it was giving me that feedback. Uh, with the original TF level, it was so slow. Uh, what I did is I moved it around a bit and then just got bored and stopped moving it. I'm pretty sure if, you, if, you, if I move this car around in, a, in, a, in the same exact pattern, it will detect, on average, uh, it will make the same predictions and it will make the same wrong predictions on the same sort of rate. But it was just the fact that the HTTP was running so quick, I could quickly get this into the right position. So it just allowed me better, better, the, a better ability to demo it in like an overfitting way. Yeah. And the, thanks, uh, the last question, sorry about that. Have you tried ULO v3 in terms of the, trying to improve the inference speed? Uh, I, so the models I've tried is I actually started with, because they have a list of pre-trained models online, I started with the MobileNet SSD version two because I thought it was better. And honestly, let me, let me show something. So honestly, it was terrible. And it didn't work with what I needed. So I had these printed out as a backup because it just it didn't work with the toy cars. And then uh, someone said, oh, they've got two models. They've got version one. I was like, why would I use version one? Surely two is better. Uh, no, it turns out version one is quite a lot better. Uh, so I haven't used any other models than just those two models. Thank you for the talk, especially the demo kit yeah. is amazing. Uh, and I have uh, like a question, There's, there are other solutions accelerating uh, infer inference on, on the Raspberry Pi, like Intel Movideos, for example. Mm -hmm. have you, do you have any comparison? Uh, have, you, have you chosen this like, intentionally or? All right. Okay, so that's a good question. So that might be other, the other uh, USB sticks available to do this sort of thing. Uh, I haven't done the comparison myself. However, there's loads of, I've, I've seen some medium posts of people that have actually done the, and that's where I got the comparison of, what it, what it looks like compared to uh, a desktop GPU. So personally, I haven't, uh, but I have seen comparisons online, and this one seems to be sort of pretty good. Awesome. Yeah. All right, we've got time for one more question, but then afterwards, I'm sure that uh, Zach would like yeah. to take any other questions out in the lobby, so over here. Uh, what's the next steps putting on an actual bike? What's the next steps? Um, just like a lot of glue, <laughs> probably. <laughs> like, I think um, I honestly have no, uh, no clue. I do want, yeah, I don't know. If Are you going to do it? Do you have any tips? Yeah, I need maybe, because I just want to get it on the bike as soon as possible. So, uh, yeah, I'll just, I'll just probably zip tie it on. How to power it? How to power it? Oh, do I have one with me? So, I don't, I don't have one with me. No, do I? <laughs> oh, wait, there's the charger. Oh, it doesn't matter. Anyway, uh, so, um, Phone, if you've ever, if you've, I'm sure some of you have phone charging battery packs. Yeah. So yeah, so it turns out uh, those, those battery packs send out like a nice stable five volts and most likely around two amps of current, which is perfect for powering the Raspberry Pi. So that's how I powered my rugby robot uh, two years ago. So I'm just gonna plug it into a, a, a phone battery bank and it should just work. All right, thanks everyone. All right. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you.